going to turn the tables on the journalist. I'd like to introduce Mr. Greg Peterson, a partner at Phillips Lytle and one of the co-founders of the Robert H. Jackson Center. That, that was fantastic. And I, as I was walking in today, and this is a huge crowd, I was given a lot of cards and suggestions of what I should ask a man of your high stature, and the one that came the most. You know, waterboarding is illegal. <laughs> but I got, or it should be. I got four or five of these cards, and I'm going to synthesize them. It said, Mr. Woodward, born in Geneva, Illinois, raised in Wheaton, 30 miles west of Chicago. Tell us, was it the Cubs or the White Sox? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it was my father, uh, who was a lawyer and a judge. And beginning at about age seven or eight, he always said to me, listen to the lawyers. They have the most profound and meaningful things to say, unless you listen carefully. <laughs> Did I just set myself up there? Is that no, what no, no. But, but, but listening, you know, lawyers have profound and meaningful things to say, but uh, by age 10, I was listening carefully. <laughs> well, speaking of your father, you, in fact, that was part of your early learning process. He was a judge, and I read someplace that you spent time rummaging around in his trash to find out some of the things that were going on. No. I was the janitor in his law firm, and I would go in at night, and I didn't have to go to the trash. I just had to look at what was on the desk. <laughs> and if I, I, there were interesting cases and disputes. This is Wheaton, Illinois, which was Billy Graham country, mm -hmm. He'd, uh, and so very evangelical. And they had in the attic the disposed files in alphabetical order. So I, people uh, who I was in class with uh, in high school, I would take their last name and go up to the attic and look. And there would be uh, the secrets, the underbelly of Wheaton, Illinois, uh, sexual assault cases, income tax, cases, uh, some senior person in the high school, I think he's, I, I know he's deceased now, so I can say it was the principal at the high school was having an affair with the most n notorious girl in the high school. <laughs> and the prosecutors wired her. And it is, um, the occasion on which I discovered the evidentiary purity of the tape recording. <laughs> Life was much easier than the knocking on doors in the late evening or going into garages, you know? Yeah. No, it, 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 was, it was easy and it was an education. Uh, and it, it, while my father was still alive, it came out that I had done this and he said, you know, Anyone would. <laughs> Robert Redford, the 2018 Vanity Fair Hall of Fame, reviewed your book, Fear. And he said, when put to our biggest test, our, however, our democracy has remained resilient because of our commitment to a free and independent media, epitomized by books like his. This is one of the most sacred of our principles, secured by the journalistic bravery required to reveal such hidden truths. Many of the journalists working today were first inspired by Woodward and his passion to serve. His country and its citizens depend on him and he them. That's 
Robert Redford's review. Of okay, and he played me in the movie version of All <laughs> a President's Man. And you have, you would think that'd be a good thing, right? I, you have no idea how many women I've disappointed. <laughs> Care to elaborate? Maybe you go on the, you, a, a blind date, you go pick her up. This is in the 70s. You knock on the door, and she opens the door. <laughs> I have seen disappointment. <laughs> In your acknowledgement of fear, highly, highly recommend it, uh, you mentioned your colleague, colleague uh, Carl Bernstein and your frequent conversations and, and disagreements with him on the, this president. Could, could you elaborate? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, Carl and I remain, remain really about as close as two people can over, you know, almost 50 years. And he looks at it from a certain direction. I look at it from a certain direction. And uh, he, he's been much more inclined to label Trump. I, I think what we need to, my approach is to describe Trump and try to understand Trump, not label him. I, I, think, uh, I think the labeling doesn't work and I found in looking at the Democratic debates, if I may divert to that, because I was going to uh, mention something about that. The Democratic debates, it was like watching a, a uh, markup session of the Senate subcommittee on health insurance. That's not what presidents do. And I, I found it alarming that the candidates all thought that's what presidents do. What presidents do is, uh, is I, or what they should do, what's the next stage of good for a majority of people? You're not going to get that as a candidate. If you look at what Bill Clinton did with his economic plan or Obama with his health care plan, they became president and they worked months and months and they had other people doing it. Presidents are talent scouts and that's why FDR was so successful. He had some general ideas and he was a talent scout. And if you look and you read uh, just about Robert Jackson, what he did, I mean, I know you're immersed in it, and, and this was somebody Roosevelt picked out of, you know, God knows where and made him general counsel of the revenue service at the time. How old? He was 11 years old at the time, wasn't he? Not quite. How old was close, he? Close, close, yeah. Close, yeah. yeah sure. And he, he found talent. That's what presidents do. Well, segueing a little bit to the Robert Jackson Center and the Alan Cole Lecture Fund, which is sponsoring this, the center's mission is to advance Robert Jackson's legacy uh, and the importance of the rule of law. Today's environment, what sense do you have that the rule of law plays in the president's decision making? Well, you see, oh boy. Uh, you know, I don't think it comes up. <laughs> I think it doesn't. I mean, he. He said it the other day. He said publicly, he said, I can do what I want. And, of course, he can't. And uh, it turns out that's what Nixon said. If the president does it, it's legal. Well, thank God that's not the case. And uh, it's, you know, any job you have, being a journalist, being a lawyer, you have to realize the limits that come with it. You know, you have limits in terms of what you can do. Uh, journalists certainly has limits, and presidents need to understand the limits that are built into the constitutional system. You mentioned when Richard Nixon was on the cusp of 
uh, resignation. He listened to the presentations by Senators Scott and Goldwater and reacted. I mean, actually listened to them. In any of your uh, investigation, as you were looking at the, writing the book Fear, was there anybody that you actually I, could identify saying, President Trump actually listens to? Well, I, I think he listens, but he doesn't, uh, he has ideas. Like, I, th I think one of the most, th there are two fronts I would look really hard at, and I'm still looking hard at, and I tried to look at in this book. Uh, and that is the economy and Trump and tariffs. He, he, as he said, he's a tariff man. Uh, pick a hundred economists at random, and you might find one who's a tariff, tariff person. Now, Trump found three, and the only three in the world, I think, or in the United States, to, uh, to, who agree with him on these tariffs. And the tariffs are taxes on consumers, on Americans. They are hurting farmers. They make absolutely no sense. I have in the book, somebody gave me the draft of a speech that Trump was writing. And in his own handwriting, he wrote out, and it's in the book, trade is bad. Now, he has not said that, but he's acted that way. Trade is actually given us the modern world. And trade has worked for the United States, has worked for countries, and there's a meeting I described where they bring Trump over to the Pentagon. And the Secretary of uh, Defense, Mattis, uh, says, you know, uh, the gift to us as Americans is this democratic order of it had three pillars, trade agreements, mutual defense agreements like NATO, and the top secret intelligence partnerships. And Trump just said it's all bullshit. And he still talks that way, and he thinks that way. And, you know, we're in a, it, it's, it's a shame for our country at this time that we're not leveraging some of the things that are going on. The other issue that I worry seriously about, and to Trump's credit, we have not had another war. He's skeptical about the wars. It was about 10 years ago that uh, General Odierno, who was the Army Chief of Staff, would invite me to come to talk about the news media to the new generals, the one stars. There were about a hundred each year. And so I'd go over and talk to him about the media. And then Odierno was a big bear of a man, a real combat veteran. He'd get up and he'd walk down the aisle and he'd say, generals, you know, kind of mocking, you know, they all have one star, he's got four. And, uh, and he said, Generals, what's the job of the army? And almost all the hands would go up. And they'd call on one, and one would say, Chief, the job of the army is to recruit, equip, equip, and train, and prepare to fight and win wars. Odierno would say, yeah, and everyone would nod. And then Odierno said, what's the second job of the army? What? Second job? We don't have a second job, do we? And no one raised their hand. And he, and he said, Generals, the second job of the Army, and it may be the first job of the Army, is to prevent war. I served in the Navy for five years in the 60s, not in combat, but on ships and off the coast of Vietnam. And read traffic top secret cables about the war in Vietnam and it was built on lies mm. in too many cases. And war is the ultimate catastrophe. 
Too often presidents have thought that war solves problems when it creates problems. If we're attacked, of course, we have to respond. Mm -hmm. In the book, uh, one of these top secret NSC meetings Trump is having with the National Security Council, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and he's on one of his terrors about NATO and all of these defense agreements. And he said, NATO, we, what do we get out of it? It costs us money, we're suckers, we're being played for suckers, we're so dumb, why do we do this? Secretary of Defense Mattis, former Marine General, said, Mr. President, we are doing these things to prevent World War III. Now, if there is one job a president has, in my view, it is to prevent war if he can, and certainly to prevent World War III. In your opening uh, pages of Fear, you talk about the story of Gary Cohn and the draft letter that was going to be sent to South Korea's president terminating the KORUS, K-O-R-U-S, agreement. And he stole it. Which is a trade agreement. A trade yeah. agreement. And he just stole it. And there were other incidences yeah. with, with Rob Porter right. uh, about that. And here you have almost, uh, obviously part of the, the thesis is government and chaos, but you have um, subordinates essentially subordinating the presidential will. Is this, does that strike you? Well, that's why it's the first chapter of the book. <laughs> And he stole the paper, the yeah. letter, and the book came out, and Trump said, oh, no, that can't be true. That's fake news. And I reproduced the letter that was stolen and the folder that Gary Cohen, who is the chef, chief economic advisor, put it in. Now it's on page nine in the book, and Trump didn't get that far. <laughs> But, it, but it, it, it's, it's concrete <laughs> evidence. And it talks about Secretary of Defense Mattis coming in and saying, Mr. President, you can't terminate this trade deal. It's essential to our relationship with South Korea and the military and top secret intelligence relationships we have. And so Trump puts it off, and he's put it off to his credit. He hasn't done it, so you ask um, whether anybody, whether he listens to anybody, I don't know, but he, he, he see, uh, do you have a to-do list that, where you write out, and then, as best I can tell, Trump has no to-do list. It, it's all spontaneous reaction. Uh, from the news, or something he's heard, or something somebody told, him, and so when they steal his papers, you know, there's no trail, and he never has canceled the South Korean trade agreement. Amazing story. Online, uh, uh, through YouTube, you can break a list to it, is a audio conversation that you had with the president, and the book is on the verge of being released, and it's an amazing conversation where you have with him uh, about all of the extraordinary efforts you made to try to get to him so he could be res respond to this in the book. If he had responded, do you get a sense of what he might have said? <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, one of my best friends said, you're so lucky you didn't interview him for the book because now everything in the book is true. <laughs> And, you know, it's my point about the truth. And if, if, I think we've talked ourselves into a dangerous state of sleepfulness about Trump. That we think, oh, lying is okay, that's just Trump. And, well, it, the, as I try to illustrate, it is the essential ingredient in a democracy and political dialogue and everything uh, that we tried to do in this country. And, you know, he's just evaporated it. I worry someday, you know, he'll 
feel cornered or get cornered or do one of these things and uh, trigger on the economic front or the national security front some sort of something that is not foreseen and expected. You talk to people who work for him now and they say they wake up at 3 a.m. in a cold sweat wondering, oh my God, it's, what has he tweeted? And then they'll go, oh, they check, he hasn't tweeted anything, and, and then at six, they, you know, I mean, again, there's no process for these kinds of things that have to do with governing the country and protecting our economy and our national security. Now, he, he, he's been lucky, we've been lucky so far, but I, I, I'm deeply worried about it, and I think even, I find, I will run into Trump supporters who say they read the book, and they say they don't, they don't like it, but it's not got that kind of, you know, nail under the fingernail. It's, okay, this happened, and, you know, he does some things, like all of his uh, skepticism about the Afghan war, a lot of military people agree with him. You're doing, you announced that you're working on a sequel. Is, does he have you on his speed dial now so that he can get, his, get a word in or two? Will he want to be part of your book? Well, certainly I'll give uh, him an opportunity. But then again, I mean, think about the, the strategy for dealing with him on something like that. I've, uh, I wake up at 3 a.m. in a cold sweat. <laughs> Think, you know, how do you do this so it's useful? And as a, uh, your uh, dedication to the, all the president's men, you said to the president's other men and women in the White House and elsewhere who took risks to provide us with confidential information. Without them, there would have been no Watergate story told by the Washington Post. Would you have used a similar acknowledgement in this fear? Absolutely. Look, I understand that people have skepticism, unnamed sources. You don't know where it comes from. But when I do one of these books, I'll hear something then and I'll check. And if you've read through the book, it's very specific. It's not. One person said the following sometime in the summer, it, summer, it says, at 525 on Tuesday, July, so-and-so, the following people met in the chief of staff's office, and then this is what the notes say. If you go to the White House and ask to talk to somebody on the record, you're going to get a press release. And, I mean, this isn't just the Trump White House, this is any White House or any organization. You had a little anecdote about you going over to the general's house and saying, are you doing this same old shit? Uh, yes, which I told you. Yeah. yeah, and because of your, uh, you've written 18 best-selling books, uh, when you get onto something, is that a help or is it a hindrance? Is this sort of a Mike Wallace moment saying, my worst day is seeing him on my front door? Uh, that's a really important question. People, uh, when you have to, when I say I'm coming to interview you, and let's say you're the Secretary of Defense, so what are you thinking? I, I'm coming to talk to you. What are you. What's going through your head? What it is that I may know that you don't know. Okay, but I... And I'm going to sit there, I'm not just going to Google you, I'm going to find the paper you wrote 27 years ago for Defense Weekly, and I'm going to say on page 36, you said the following, what did you mean? And you might think, I, th I thought only my mother read that <laughs> damn paper. And it's not a ruse, I want to know how you think. And I want you to know I take you as seriously as you take yourself. And if I come bopping in and I, oh yeah, where, 
you know, how old are you? Where you? I've gone to interview people and it's been their birthday. I, I don't bring cupcakes, but I <laughs> say happy birthday. And people take themselves seriously. And also, like the general, people believe in the First Amendment, I think. I think when you go and you say that, I'm calling you on the phone, setting up our interview. What am I going to say? What should I say? We haven't met your assistant secretary of defense. Mm -hmm. I call and I say, hi, uh, this is Bob Woodward from the Washington Post. What am I, what's my next line? Uh, I need your help. Yes, exactly. You read that. I did. I've said that. <laughs> I like need to think was an original, your help. But yeah, and what does it do immediately in terms of our relationship? I'm going to try to help you. Well, it makes it clear to you, I'm the one who's needy. You can say no, and I'm not coming in and saying, hey, I know you stole the money. <laughs> I'm coming in honestly and saying, I need your help. And uh, so the journalistic trends, it is amazing. Just last week. Uh, I had somebody come to the house for an interview and you, you wouldn't believe who it was. You would say, no, this is not possible. And it was supposed to be for lunch and it was, but it was a five hour lunch. Hmm. Because why? Because people want to talk about their business. I'm devoting I know what that person did on Wednesday, July, da da, and they are, people get into it, people believe in, even people who have, have things to hide or things they're embarrassed about. No, not always. Often people are, you're not going to get through. But we, we have a, strong citizenry that believes in its government and believes in the First Amendment. You had 18 books. At what point in your, invest in your research writing do you say, I have enough, I'm going to stop? Uh, but you never have enough. And, but you have to kind of say, I have enough. <laughs> and to... Uh, it, it's a kind of artificial deadline. I wanted this to come out after the first year and a half before the 2018 congressional elections to describe for people what I found was going on. And uh, so, you know, that's... So you, you kind of have a deadline and you hope. So what's a question you expected me to ask now as we draw closure that I haven't, that you just can't wait to answer? <laughs> well, you know, here's the, here's the big question. I'm, uh, the way I look at this book is Act 1 and Act 2 of the Trump presidency. I'm working on Act 3 and 4 for the second book. And the question that pulses through all of this is why? Why did he want to become president? What's the real reason, if you can find it? And then why, in the Mueller Russia investigation, he found no coordination, no conspiracy. If you were Trump's lawyer and you got the Mueller report, what would you do? You'd celebrate, yeah. right? Yeah. You'd say, hey, no collusion, no conspiracy, some uh, kind of uh, obstruction of justice acts that are not, don't involve money or destruction of documents, the, the normal things you say. So why was Trump so exercised about Russia? And I, part of the psychological assessment that I think needs to be made about Trump is he 
has received a self-validation being elected president that none you you never receive in your work I never receive in my work and he made it to the top he was you know everyone said uh, oh you you're not gonna make it it's and he got there and looking at eight other presidents they the word that all come often comes up in uh, memoirs or books or work later after a presidency is the word destiny. Lots of presidents feel ah, kind of destined. And I think Trump feels that in a much larger scale than most presidents. The, one of the results is it gives him a self-confidence. And all, I think all presidents are isolated. I think Trump is the most isolated president of them all. I think you, you go interview cabinet officers, White House aides, and they'll say they're going to go in there, they're going to tell him the truth. Well, Trump doesn't like to hear truth or bad news. And most of the time, these experienced, strong people fade and get weak. And so they're not helping him. And that's, that is a tragedy. For, he's going to be our president under normal circumstances for the next you know, 15 months or so. All people ought to be helping him. And my approach is I think he's made gigantic mistakes. I think he's made mistakes that... I mean, you, I'm sure you have clients who get in their own way and are, don't know their own self-interest. I think Trump is a president who does not know what his self-interest is. And we're all paying for that. And uh, it's risky. And it was George Kennan, the father of the containment doctrine mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union wrote so eloquently about government and he said uh, what happens around presidents and high officials is the what he called the treacherous curtain of deference people get in there and I've been in the Oval Office interviewing lots of presidents many times and it's true is there's something my god this it's what people don't realize the Oval Office is the best lit room in America. They did something with the lighting so there are no shadows. Mm. Everything comes and you know, it's the Oval Office. And so that treacherous curtain of deference comes down if you work for, for now. As a journalist, you can go in and ask the meanest question in the world. And you know, you, you know, it, anyway, just stylistically, I think that doesn't work. But, Trump is isolated, and it is in his interest, it is in the interest of the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, and the people in this country, and the people in the news media, to not to get help him get out of his isolation, and calling him a racist or a white supremacist and so forth, as some people do, and there's a basis for that, but that's, that's this labeling, which I think is a barrier to understanding. This is a moment in time, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome and thank Bob Woodward. Thank you. 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 flying high you know how I feel sun in the sky you know 